Welcome, I'm Renee Fry McKibben, Professor of Economics at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU and co-director of the COVID-19 and the Macroeconomy Research Program, um, jointly with Joaquim Vespignani. So I would, um, I'm excited to, for, for you to join us uh, in this webinar today. We have three panelists, Anthony Goldblum, David Gruen and Tara Sinclair. So I'd just like to ask um, our panelists to turn on their uh, cameras. Okay, so um, we're just waiting for Anthony. He's having trouble um, coming in, but I'll just do um, our introduction and um, then I will go and work out how to get him to join us. Um, so David Groen will, will be our, our first speaker. But let me start with Anthony. I, it's nice to talk about him while he's not here. Um, Anthony Goblin is the CEO of Kaggle, which is a Google company, the world's largest data science and machine learning community with over five MM members, I don't know what MM means, but um, Forbes has twice named Anthony one of the 30 under 30 in technology. The MIT Technology Review has named him as one of the 35 innovators under 35 and the University of Melbourne has given Anthony an Alumni of Distinction Award. award. David Gruen uh, was appointed Australian statistician on the 11th of December, 2019. So he's obviously had uh, a very interesting um, first um, period of, of time at um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. He's accountable for the functions and operations of the Bureau. David was previously the Deputy Secretary for Economic and Australia's uh, G20 Sherpa at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Before joining the department in se September 2014, he was Executive Director of the Macroeconomic Group at the Australian Treasury. David joined the Treasury in January 2003, before which he was the head of the Economic Research Department at the Reserve Bank of Australia from 1998 to 2002. Before joining the Reserve Bank, David worked as a research scientist in the Research School of Physical Sciences at the Australian National University, with financial support from a Fulbright um, postdoctoral fellowship. David was visiting lecturer in the Economics Department and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University from August 1991 to June 1993. He holds PhD degrees in physiology from Cambridge University um, in England and in economics from the ANU. Tara Sinclair is Associate Professor of Economics and International Affairs at the George Washington University and a Senior Fellow at the Job Search site Indeed. Tara earned her PhD in economics from Washington University in St. Louis in 2005. As part of the Indeed hiring lab, Tara uses Indeed's unique labour market data to develop new economic indicators. She's also co-director of the GW Research Program on Forecasting, a member of the Bureau of Labor Statistics Technical Advisory Committee, a research professor at the Hall Institute for Economic Research in Germany, and a research associate at um, Karma. Tara regularly speaks at conferences and with the press on issues related to forecasting, recessions, labor markets, big data, macroeconomics, and policy issues. So each of our speakers today will have around um, 10 minutes for their opening remarks and then we'll open up to the audience for discussion. So if you'd like to ask a question, use the Q&A function on Zoom. So you will see a box with the Q&A um, label on your device that you can type your question into. You can also see other questions that others have asked. And if there is a question that you particularly like, you can use the thumbs up symbol to upvote the question. And I will pose the most popular questions to the panelists. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we're recording this session, which will be available on the Karma website after the event. Um, so as this is a webinar, you won't be seen in the footage unless I ask you to turn on your camera. Okay, so I will, um, I think we, we might still start with David, um, and then we'll go to Anthony and then Tara. So um, I'll ask the other Anthony and Tara to turn off their camera and microphone and um, David to uh, begin his presentation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Renee, and hopefully you can hear me. We can. Um, and can you see my presentation or do I have to open it? Um, you need to open it and then okay. share. So Does that work? Not yet. Okay, screen one. How's that? It's coming up, yeah, that's good. Uh, is that good? Uh -huh. So I'll just, wor uh, I'll just work my way through um, the presentation. Uh, what I thought it might be useful to do is give a sense of, um, uh, of how the Bureau has responded um, to the arrival of the of COVID-19 because um, uh, I thought that might be of interest to um, uh, to people on the webinar. So let me uh, let me see if I can drive this. 
Uh, how do I make it go forward? Let's see here. No, that's not going to work. Ah, uh, that's it. Good. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you can see the the screen. Um, so uh, in mid to late February, um, I, I, it was a case of looking overseas and seeing that um, the virus had spread beyond Wuhan and uh, particularly in Italy and Iran. Uh, and that when it arrived, it was clear. So, I mean, the new, there wasn't so much news coming out of Iran, but the news out of Northern Italy was very clear that when this when this virus arrived, it could spread really quickly and be extraordinarily disruptive. Um, for me, it felt a lot like mid two thousand and eight. In mid two thousand and eight, I was in the I was working in Treasury, and there was uh, this kind of growing uh, dread that there was a there was an evolving crisis overseas, which was having enormous effects. And obviously, then in that case, it was the collapse of Lehman's that in in mid uh, September of two thousand of, of two thousand and eight that really uh, where things went from bad to catastrophic. But there was very much a feeling of uh, that we were that something was brewing. And given that I was now um, running the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, I had this strong sense, having lived through the previous crisis where there was a, only a very limited amount of near real time information, that being in a position to, to um, provide more re near real time information, uh, the Bureau has, uh, has uh, a lot of resources and um, uh, a lot of expertise and so we were in a we were in a unique position to help and so we had a brainstorming session on the on at the very end of february this was still at a time before the before things had got serious in australia and 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 the question was and i posed the question to a bunch of people here uh you know what could we do how could we do it faster um, and it was basically providing the organisation with permission to to do new things uh, and um, very much with the idea that the crisis meant that the normal rules didn't need to apply and um, we could try and do new things. And I had this, I had a strong suspicion that there would be enormous interest from government and the community if we were able to produce uh, new products. Um, the first thing we did was, um, and the other thing that I thought was that, uh, that that the time was of the essence. So it wasn't a case of going through the normal bureaucratic channels to get funding for this. It was just a case of running these surveys and and uh, and seeing where we got to. Uh, so we set up quite quickly um, uh, small surveys. One of uh, of a panel of households that was about a thousand households and then a survey of about uh, 1200 businesses ask just asking to begin with just asking straightforward questions about uh, about um how they what to what extent was the was the spread of the virus in, uh, having an impact on their trading conditions all that sort of thing and the beauty of this was that um given that the surveys were so small, we could uh, collect the data. We have, a, we have 400 interviewers uh, who, we can, um, who we employ and we, can, um, we couldn't do face-to-face -face interviews anymore. So this was all done over the telephone. But we have, um, we have uh, obviously techniques for, for making sure that we can get a, get a sample and make it representative. And we could um, collect the data in, or oh, uh, the order of days and analyze it in the order of days. And the first, to give you a sense of it, uh, the first business impact survey went into the field on the 16th of March and we published the results on the 26th of March. So that's completely unheard of for, um, for the Bureau of Statistics. We've never done anything that fast. Um, and it's obviously a case of, of sacrificing uh, um, uh, purity for speed. Um, normally, we wouldn't run a survey of, of, of 1,200 businesses. We'd run a survey of many, many more than that. But you can still generate, in, in, in a circumstance where things are changing rapidly, um, you generate a lot of interesting and useful information. And so we've been running these household and business surveys every two or three weeks since um, since March uh, and, and updating the questions every time. So this is very different from collecting 
uh, something like the labor force survey where the questions never change and you're trying to generate a time series which is comparable through time and comparable with other countries. The aim here was to collect uh, bespoke information that was of particular relevance to the decisions that were being made at the time. So we connected ourselves in with key government departments, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, Treasury and Health, and we had a panel that we set up quite quickly for suggesting questions for the next survey. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing we did was go, go in search of new administrative data sets that could again provide uh, near real-time information. And the third thing we did was to start releasing uh, several weeks early preliminary information from surveys uh, like retail trade, where you can release the you can release um, results from 80% of your sample two or three weeks before the final is released. And again, because things were happening so rapidly with the panic buying and things like that, it provided information much more quickly to policymakers than was previously the case. So we thought that was valuable as well. Um, this is just a little, uh, a little visual, which I won't stay on for too long, which just gives you a sense of the sort of information um, that, we, that we worked out from the business survey. So what proportion of businesses reported a decrease in revenue and uh, almost one in three had reported a decrease in revenue of more than 50%. And we, our, we had enough data to be able to disaggregate by firm size and also by sector. So, so that was uh, kind of, um, that was kind of, um, that was kind of quite revealing on the right hand side. Uh, you can see 87% of education and training businesses recorded a, a decreased income. And then the other sectors that were particularly hard hit were accommodation and food, which saw 84% see a fall in their income, uh, et, et cetera. And you also pick up a few firms that are seeing a rise in their income. So you get some, uh, you get some, uh, some, you can, you can, you can actually find out information at a reasonably granular level, which is useful. Uh, the other thing that happened, which was extraordinarily valuable was, um, we had been in discussions with the Australian Tax Office for some time about getting access to their single touch payroll data. Let me just explain what that is. Uh, for, for a few years now, the, the uh, Tax Office has been building a web-based tool by which employers can interact with the tax office every time they do their payroll. So that's a week, that's every week or every fortnight, depending on how frequently they pay their, their workers. And um, they send electronically information about tax wages and superannuation to, uh, to the tax office. Uh, by now, um, for it's basically got all, it's got 99% of employers uh, with, with more than, with 20 or more employees and 71% of small employers. So it doesn't capture every employee in the country, but it's not far off. So, and the share of small employers, the share of uh, companies with less than 20 employees uh, that's reporting through single touch payroll is going up all the time. When I made this slide, it was 71%, we're, we're up over 80% now. So the point is that we get data, we get a weekly feed from the tax office on, uh, on not every employee in Australia, but not, not too far off it. And so we can, create again um, either aggr aggregated across the country or by state or by region or by uh, or by industry sector or by size or by age there's a whole lot of ways you can cut this data um, and we publish with a 17 day lag the evolving uh, if you uh, number of a number of paid employees in the country so this data comes out a lot faster than the labor force uh, just to give you a live example um, the latest publication of this was Tuesday this week, and that published results up to the 27th of June. Uh, and uh, later on this morning, we will publish the Labor Force survey for June, which uh, only covers the first two weeks. So this is much more, this is much closer to real time than the Labor Force survey. It obviously doesn't capture er everybody who's got a job because it's only employees. It doesn't capture sole, sole traders. But nevertheless, this has been an enormous uh, step forward in being able to, pr 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 to uh, provide high quality information to the community and to governments 
on, um, uh, on, on much more timely than uh, than was possible in the past. Um, I've got just got some the sort of information that you can generate. Um, uh, this gives you, a, if you can see this picture, it shows you two, two time periods, uh, 14th of March to the 11th of April, and then the 11th of April to the 2nd of May. You could, in principle, update this to all the way to the 27th of June if you wanted to. And it shows by sector, uh, which sectors have suffered the biggest changes in employment. So uh, in the period from the 14th of March to the 11th of April, accommodation and food services lost about a third of their workforce. Um, there are some technical issues, which I won't go into about exactly what this measures, but I'm happy to answer the questions about it. And arts and recreation saw a, a, a quarter of their, of their um, workforce disappear. And then there's been some, some of, there's been, that's come back to some extent, as you can see from the 11th of April to the 2nd of May, accommodation and food services saw about a 9% uh, increase in uh, in in the in the number of jobs, so this is extremely rich. Um, some of the other things that I talked about a little bit, we've we've been producing preliminary um, information uh, several weeks early on international merchandise trade, retail trade, overseas travel, and we've now um, we've now we're now generating monthly mortality statistics, which is a little on the morbid side, but nevertheless of interest. So uh, there's a big debate overseas about the extent to which there are excess deaths that are not being picked up, not, not being uh, directly associated with COVID-19. Uh, and many countries are seeing big increases in deaths uh, over and above the number of people who have died, who have been identified as having died of, um, of uh, COVID-19. And we're in a position now to see whether we're seeing anything similar in Australia. And we're about to publish uh, new, new results, which will throw light on that. The other thing we've been, we've been doing is generating interactive maps um, so we've got a mapping technology that enables to look at concentrations uh, and initially we did it for at risk populations. So that was older workers and people with comorbidities, but increasingly we've done it on uh, a geographical distribution of job losses using the single touch payroll data and looking at where job losses are concentrated. Um, and then the other thing that we've, uh, we've done is uh, we've got a we've got a technology which enables people uh, to access data virtual micro data virtually. Uh, uh, in a, you, know, you have to be in Australia, um, but uh, and provided you um, you have been kind of certified as a as a fit and proper person, um, you can get access to these data. Uh, and we've been we've been pumping out information, uh, we've been pumping out information uh, into those uh, sources. A couple of other things that have been uh, kind of the sort of issues that statistical agencies have to worry about. Um, we've had reduced response rates, not as badly as some other countries. The US, for instance, in their labor force survey, their equivalent of the labor force survey has seen huge falls in response rates. We've managed to keep our falls uh, moderate, but not, but we still have falls in response rates. We had to stop face-to-face -face collection uh, qu for quite a long time, but this is an opportunity to try and convince people to fill in forms on the web. So we've had big increases in, as, as and this is kind of common across lots of uh, disciplines, but we've seen big increases in the num in the proportion of people who fill in there, uh, who who are in our surveys who fill them in on, who have, who fill them in on uh, online. So that's kind of a that's kind of a. Um, uh, that's kind of a, uh, a, 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 a looking on the bright side. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to say was um, there are kind of technical issues to do with um, having to suspend season, uh, having to suspend trend estimates because because when you have these enormous uh, uh, movements in series and and I would say the majority of our macro series have seen uh, enormous movements um, and you, there are technical issues about suspending trend uh, uh, measurements simply because um, they uh, they become misleading uh, so so that that's not that that's not um, that, that that's kind of interest of interest to aficionados and it becomes something that you have to concentrate on so what we end up doing is publishing both our original numbers and our seasonally adjusted numbers and simply suspending the trend until things settle down uh, I might leave it there uh, and um, 
hand back to you, Renee. Thanks, David. I will ask you to turn off your video and microphone and ask um, Anthony to um, proceed with his presentation. Okay, I th think and hope, uh, I assume someone will tell me if you can't hear me, um, but I'm going to proceed assuming that you can. We can as hear a you. Very good. All right. As a, as a Google employee, uh, they don't like us using Zoom. They like us using Google Meet. So I feel a little bit like I'm learning how to do this. All right. Um, so I'm going to find my screen to share. All right. Very good. Um, so um, first of all, just a, um, just one caveat. Um, I'm currently on parental leave, so there is. I'm going to present some of the projects that Kaggle has been working on around COVID-19. Uh, but there's some um, chance that some of the the projects that we've been working on uh, have progressed um, uh, past what I'm presenting here. So there is some chance uh, that there's some interesting new things that I'm not covering. Um, so just as a quick introduction, I think unlike the Australian Bureau of Statistics that needs no introduction, probably a lot of you uh, or some of you don't know Kaggle. Um, we're a startup, we started in, um, or we're a startup started in Melbourne, Australia, um, moved to the Bay Area um, in about, around 2012. And as of 2017, um, we're now, we got acquired by Google. So we're now part of Google. Um, what we're best known for is running uh, data science machine learning challenges. So um, we'll take a data set put it up on our website and people compete to build the, the, uh, the um, most accurate algorithm. We actually do a little bit more than that now, um, uh, but that's, that's still uh, the most, you know, a, a decent amount of what we do um, and also the, the bits that are most relevant um, to our COVID-19 work. Um, uh, our community is a little bit over 5 million. We passed 5 million a, a couple of weeks ago, um, which I think is just incredible. You know, there are 5 million people in the world who are interested enough in data science, machine learning, um, uh, that they, they sign up to, to this website. Um, and so to, in today's presentation, um, I'm going to go over some of the, the challenges that we have, um, we've run um, in connection to COVID-19, both, you know, what the challenges were and what some of the, the results were. Um, uh, so our um, uh, touch points with COVID-19 uh, really started in um, mid-March. Um, I think uh, it was in early February that the US first had, uh, I live in San Francisco, it was in early February that the US kind of started seeing its first cases. And this was in Seattle, just north of uh, San Francisco. Um, and probably like a lot of people, we were wondering about, um, you know, what, what can we do to make some kind of contribution here uh, and didn't really have any good ideas. Um, and, and then out of the blue, we got an email from um, Michael Kratzios, who is the White House officer. Uh, he's the White House Chief Technology Officer. Um, and what they had done is uh, they had put in, the White House had put a tremendous amount of work into um, getting all the academic journals to make all COVID-19 literature open access as well as um, literature on historical uh, coronaviruses. And I think at the time, I can remember this, there were somewhere in the order of 20,000 uh, papers on uh, either COVID-19 or historical coronaviruses. At the time, actually, most of them were historical coronaviruses. Um, now, today, there are 35,000 papers on uh, COVID-19 alone. Um, and what the, the White House accurately foresaw is that the liter or already at that time, I think the publishing rate was somewhere in the order of 20 papers per day were being published on COVID-19, you know, some preprints, some um, uh, uh, you know, peer reviewed. Uh, and that number, you know, the only thing that has grown as fast as the case count is the number of papers uh, being published. It's also grown exponentially. I, I think we're at to somewhere in the, the range of a th um, uh, maybe it's 5,000 papers per week or, so, or something like that now. And this is a completely unmanageable number of papers. Um, and so what they did is they, um, they approached us and they said, look, we've got all these um, uh, we've got we've got the journals to publish all, all this uh, literature in an open access and actually machine readable form. Um, can we put this um, th these papers in a digitized form in, or a machine readable form in front of your com community and can see if they can build tools um, to, to help cone through the literature? And and uh, so this was how we first got involved. Um, with COVID-19 related projects. Um, so I'm going to go through um, uh, that project first, uh, and then I'm going to go through, we, we subsequently have launched a couple of others, and I'm going to go through those afterwards. Um, so 
Um, the, the, the range of solutions on the automated literature review, um, this is one example. So somebody wrote a question answering tool. Uh, and so you, what you can do is you can type in a question and out and uh, uh, his algorithms use very advanced uh, modern nat natural language processing techniques um, and a, a set of algorithms um, uh, known as BERT uh, in order to try and to the best of their knowledge answer the questions and you can see on the right hand side here not only are they answering the questions but they're giving you know some sort of confidence score around whether or not the snippet that they have presented has answered the question um, this is on the more ambitious end um, um, and then we also had people um, uh, pulling out for, for key questions um, pulling out what every single paper says on key questions. So one of the questions that scientists care a lot, or sorry, that policymakers uh, care a lot about is what is the incubation period of the virus? You know, how many days is it? Uh, and the incubation period is how long between, you know, first, first uh, uh, contact and, um, or, or, or first exposure uh, and, and somebody um, uh, starting to really show symptoms. And so, the, you know, they wanted to get, get a sense because that impacts things like how long is a quarantine, uh, for example. Um, and so for a, a lot of key questions um, where there was a large number of papers written uh, that, that might answer a specific question, um, uh, you know, some of the algorithms went through and, uh, and cr created what I call like an automated literature review where it goes through and you get, you get a very, very quick sense of what, what all the papers um, are, are showing, you know, extracting the, 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 the key results. Um, and most importantly, as new papers come in, you can, you know, rerun the algorithm over the corpus of new papers and, and, and have this be kind of like a real time updating um, uh, live literature review. Um, this uh, this project, I think, has been a very exciting one. It's got a, a, a lot of attention um, uh, in, in, in various corners. It was uh, covered in Nature Magazine, Science Magazine, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. And so this is, you know, hopefully a tool that scientists are, um, are, are using uh, to, to help them stay on top of the literature. And this is actually, um, you know, Kaggle has incubated this project, but it now lives with um, uh, a, uh, a it, it's, uh, it's managed by a, a medical researcher team uh, out in um, the, the east coast of the US. So we are actually, you know, we've done it and we've made our contribution to this and, and, uh, and now it lives elsewhere. Um, the second challenge is more of a, 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 a standard um, challenge for us. Um, it's a, a forecasting challenge. Um, and uh, the goal here was to forecast cases and fatalities by, by city and county. Uh, we ran five co cohorts of this challenge um, and a little bit unusual for Kaggle challenges, we required that everybody make all their code completely public. Um, the idea was, um, yes, there's a long history of epidemiological modeling, um, um, but um, the Kaggle community community does a nice job of bringing new ideas to a problem. And, uh, and so to the extent that the community was coming up with new ideas, we wanted them to be accessible uh, to uh, anybody who uh, might be interested in using it. And we've, we've had quite a few uh, inbound requests or questions from people who have looking, been looking at the models, which has been nice to see. Um, um, we've done a, a so the, the, how the challenge worked is um, we would give people a training data set with the history of cases and fatalities uh, by by city or, or by county, um, you know, up until a certain point, and then they would have to make predictions over the next month. Uh, and we ran five cohorts of this challenge. Uh, so you, uh, you'd get data up until, I forget what the first cohort was, I think it was the beginning of April, let's say April the 5th, um, and then you have to forecast over the subsequent 28 days. Um, uh, then we'd give people data up till April the 12th and then they'd have to sub forecast over the subsequent 28 days. Um, what we found is um, we benchmarked the, the Kaggle models against um, um, uh, some of the well-known epidemiological modeling m models that are th that have been widely followed. Um, the IHME model is uh, probably the highest profile that comes out of the University of Washington. Um, it was known to have some funny assumptions, um, like it had a, an assumption around the rise of the virus and the fall of the virus, the virus falling off in a symmetrical way to the speed that it rose. Like it has a lot of sort of known uh, imperfections. It was interesting when we benchmarked it, it, it was one of the less well-performing models, which was not a surprise. Um, this, uh, by the way, I forgot to explain the y axis is a measure of error. In this case, we're using root mean squared log error. Um, uh, the y axis is um, error, the x axis is uh, forec forecasting cohort. So, um, so you can see this is an early April cohort. 
uh, whereas uh, uh, this model was from a May 24th cohort. Uh, the strongest performing model came from, um, uh, professional model came from Los Alamos National Labs, uh, and we looked at top Kaggle performing uh, models um, and how, how they performed and uh, was really delighted to see that the, the, the top Kaggle models were sort of on par with uh, the stronger epidemiological uh, modeling, professional models. Um, um, you know, some of the, the, the uh, as, as I said, we required that everybody uh, publish, make their models uh, completely public to give them the opportunity to be useful. And it was, you know, really interesting to browse um, things like the variable importance plots, um, which is a, a measure of what is doing most of the work in the models. Um, the big thing we found was that perhaps unsurprisingly, the time series features tended to dominate, but it was nice to see things like um, this is a mobility measure. Um, this model included both the Google and Apple mobility uh, mobility data. Um, it was nice to see that the the extent to which people were attending their workplaces um, lagged by nine days. Uh, you know, had a meaningful impact. Um, so yes, the models typically were d dominated by time series features, but you did see some some other features uh, playing some, some, somewhat of a role. Um, and then the last challenge was probably the least, um, the, the most unusual as far as Kaggle's challenges were concerned. It was just a, a pure data set challenge. Um, one thing, uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, encourage our community to put together data sets that um, could be useful to researchers um, in coming to conclusions. You know, one thing we noticed early was um, there was a, um, uh, you know, a lot of questions about things like what are the impact of temperature and humidity on the transmission of COVID-19? And if you looked at the papers that were being written, you know, very often they were doing things like just looking at 100 Chinese cities, for instance, which is not a very large uh, data set. Now our community has amazing data managing skills. Um, and so we wanted them to put together very use useful panels of data that, that researchers like this group could, could then use um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to draw stronger conclusions. Um, um, so as an example, you know, in response to this challenge, somebody did put together a data set um, looking at every single location in the John Hopkins University data set, found the, the nearest weather station um, and, uh, and, and uh, pu published, you know, daily weather information uh, for each location, um, which would, you know, this was sitting on our website available for any researcher who wants to, to uh, uh, re-examine uh, this question and, and do so in a, uh, on a larger um, panel of data. Um, so, so those are the, the three projects we, uh, we have done around COVID-19 and, and some of the outcomes from, from them. Um, if you want to take a look at the projects there, uh, some of them are, as I said, now closed or they've moved off our website they're in, they're in production somewhere else, but you can see them. You can see them all listed at Kaggle.com forward slash COVID-19. Um, and we also have tried to keep a log of the, t the takeaways at Kaggle.com uh, dash uh, COVID, sorry, forward slash COVID dash 19 dash contributions. Uh, and that is it for me. I'll pass back to Renee. Thanks, Anthony. Renee asked me to just go ahead and jump straight in here. Um, so I am Tara Sinclair and let me share my screen here. All right. Um, are you guys seeing my slides or are you seeing my Zoom? I just wanna make sure no one's complaining. So I guess we'll go with this. Yes. Um, great. <laughs> uh, so I'm Tara Sinclair. I'm in Washington, DC right now. I'm a professor at George Washington University. And I also work with the Indeed Hiring Lab. Uh, and I started working with them uh, about uh, well, well over five years ago now. And I, I came to them as a macroeconomist interested in forecasting, particularly interested in recessions. And I, I long knew that uh, their data would be most interesting to me and to the kinds of trends that I'm interested in uh, at the time of a next recession. Uh, of course, we had no idea that it would be anything like this crisis that we're finding ourselves in. Um, but you know, it's been interesting how my work with them has evolved over the last few years and really how I've, I've learned to understand more about how uh, big data can be used in different contexts 
uh, and particularly thinking about private sector data. Um, and so what I'd like to just share in my opening remarks here is a little bit about um, you know, kind of my, my views on you know, both how private data can provide specific insights in a crisis um, and also examples of what we've been doing with the Indeed data. Um, so um, first of all, just a, a caveat here that um, this was shared by a, a former colleague of mine um, on Twitter the other day. Um, and she's really emphasizing something important that um, those of us who work with private sector data tend to be the most skeptical of private sector data um, because we know where all the skeletons are in, in the closet and we know all of the uh, potential uh, business practices that might play a role or anomalies that might play a role. Um, and I have a whole other talk that I can talk about those issues. And so I'm going to focus on you know, kind of some of the usefulness of the data, but I'm happy to talk about um, problems and issues and concerns um, in questions or at, at a later date. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I kind of see that there are two stages of the usefulness of private data in a crisis. Uh, and we're still primarily in the early stage of the crisis is the way I would describe it. And this is where timeliness really matters. And this is why people have really grabbed onto a lot of private sector data is because it is just so much more timely. Um, but then I also want to emphasize a little bit at the end that granularity, I think, will really matter later if we're wanting to really tease out later which policies had an impact on the economy and which ones didn't. The fine granularity that's available uh, from private data sources might be really useful there, too. Um, and so we're excited to move on to that um, and see some more insights. But right now, we're really still focused on timeliness, um, where the way I would describe it is you know, initially, um, you know, in those first days of, you know, really for us, it was early to mid-March uh, when we really realized that we were starting to see big, scary numbers um, and that we needed to find a way to share those numbers. Um, and, and of course, they were uh, big, but um, in absolute value, but negative. Um, so just to kind of walk you through a little bit of my experience looking at the Indeed data. Uh, I'm just taking um, some, I, I, our normalized tracker of job postings on Indeed. I selected some countries, so the blue line, for those of you in Australia, you might wanna watch the blue line. Uh, the US is the orange line, and I threw in Italy, Sweden, and the UK, uh, just for, for others. Um, but you'll, you'll notice that um, in a lot of ways, these guys move together. So we started noticing this downturn um, already in, in early March um, across the countries. It all kind of seemed to turn uh, for this set of countries at about the, the same time. And you know, we're used to uh, job postings growing. Um, you know, for uh, many years now, uh, globally, we've really been seeing um, improvements uh, in economies as well as more and more representation of jobs on online sites. Um, and fewer jobs that were advertised outside of the online world. Uh, so to see a drop like this was, was really surprising in March. And then by mid-March, um, you know, some of our, our countries were looking at um, you know, something like a 20% drop as compared to where they were at the beginning of February. Um, you know, particularly, that was Australia's case. Uh, and then in April, that continued. Um, by May, we started to see um, some some turn to where that steepness was was coming out of the trend line, and I was starting to breathe again. Uh, those you know, first couple months, we were very very aggressively trying to get this information into people's hands, uh, and so I'm going to talk briefly in a minute about um, a, a project that I've been involved with that we've been calling our, our policy partnerships, uh, where we've been trying to get. Um, you know, as much of this data as we can into the hands of policymakers around the world. Um, and so that's what we were scrambling to do during that time. And then of course, um, in May and then into June, uh, things started to stabilize in, in most of the countries. Uh, and we've seen some improvement in most markets, uh, generally um, 
since since then. Um, but of course, we're you know, here here in the U.S. There's much discussion and much concern about if there might be uh, further declines in the in the future if um, we continue to struggle here with controlling the virus. So I mentioned that uh, we were really actively sharing data with policymakers during this time. And you know, one of the key questions that I got early on, but also um, you know, both you know, inside and outside the company is like, why should we share data with policymakers? And so this is important uh, from an Indeed perspective is that Indeed has a mission of we help people get jobs. This is like a slide that we put in every presentation for Indeed data. And so this was really critical was um, emphasizing that um, you know, policymakers are trying to help people get jobs. And so this is directly aligned uh, with the, the mission of Indeed. And so we got very quick buy-in uh, in order to try and move forward on this project in a way that um, you know, previously, you know, there's a lot of challenges in getting private sector data into the hands of policymakers, both from the company side, as well as from the policymaker side, because there's a lot of questions about representativeness and um, quality of the data and you know all the business decisions that are going into making the data. Those those are all real issues that we wrestle with. But again, we were just seeing such dramatic numbers, and everybody wanted that timely information. And of course, they were going to triangulate it with a lot of other information that was coming in. Uh, so just some quick examples here. Um, so um, the Bank of England has talked about using the Indeed data. Um, so there's this great uh, nature interview of one of the economists there. The whole I, I re recommend reading the whole interview, um, but he did briefly mention um, our our project, and it was interesting because he talked both about the aggregate numbers, these big scary numbers, um, in in the sense of talking about um, you know fewer than half the jobs posted each day than what they would expect in normal circumstances. So he goes directly for that big aggregate number. So he's he's anchoring on that um, timeliness aspect. Uh, but then he mentions later on that uh, you know the the data isn't the same as what you would get from a statistical agency, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, but they, he, then he points out the rich granularity, and I think that's what we're going to be looking for later. Uh, but of course, right now, like digging into the granularity, I mean, we're seeing drops almost everywhere. Uh, so we're we're doing you know obviously a, a lot of that in the background. But what's really getting picked up in terms of interest is the aggregate numbers now, which is the exact opposite of what I'd seen over the last five plus years where everybody was like, okay, let's dig under the hood because like the big numbers are kind of you know, boring. They, they're no longer boring. Um, similarly, so again, uh, the Bank of England talked about um, the, the drop in uh, online vacancy postings compared to pre-crisis levels. So again, hitting that big aggregate number. Oops, somehow I jumped to the end. Uh, okay, I don't know why that slide switched, but um, I'll get back to that, that one in a minute. Um, so similarly, the OECD looked at comparing across a bunch of different countries and again, showing that big aggregate drop across countries. So there's that uh, geographic comparison that I think is, is interesting for, for policymakers uh, from data from an international company that sometimes isn't possible to get um, comparable data across countries. You know, the OECD often has very lagging data in order to be able to be comparable across countries and we were able to give them uh, very timely data. Uh, the Bank of Canada, or sorry, this is uh, um, Finance Canada. Um, it, they were also interested in looking at regional comparisons that they could get from our data. So they have um, a couple of different vacancy indicators that the government collects there, um, but they also wanted to look at that regional breakdown uh, from the Indian data. Uh, and you know, similarly, uh, the Central Bank of Ireland was also looking at, again, these, these trends uh, that were pretty aggregated, except they were broken down to the regional level. Um, although they also started doing some other interesting research. So this is uh, joint with uh, an economist in uh, London um, looking at the unemployed persons per job posting. So they were able to, to look at you know, kind of a, a deeper and different indicator than just the drop in postings, but trying to look more um, at um, you know, that relationship between the number of em employed and the job opportunities out there. So just to sum up, 
Um, I want to emphasize that my view is that usually quality data is worth the wait. You know, in normal times, uh, monthly, quarterly data releases that are carefully done, um, you know, comprehensive, consistent over long time horizons, that, that data is key. And it's still key to have as benchmarks, even in a crisis. And that is the work that is done well by statistical agencies. And we always want to say that our data is complementary to what the, the statistical agencies do, um, not in any way thinking that this is uh, in any way a, a replacement. Um, our data has value, though, and it has uh, value currently, you know, in terms of a speed uh, in, in this crisis. Um, and in fact, you know, some of that past data wasn't necessarily informative about what was happening right around the time of COVID. Having the long trend wasn't really very informative. We just needed a couple months of data to get like, okay, those were the old times. Now we're in the new times. Um, and so getting those big scary numbers in the hands of policymakers, I, I really feel like um, it helped the speed of response in, in some areas. And so I'm really, really happy to have been involved in that project. Um, and then longer term, I'm really excited about the, the gains that we can get from granularity in private sector data of all, of all sorts, you know, in, in deep data on um, job postings, as well as on job uh, seeker features. Um, but, you know, people have been looking at all sorts of different granularity from credit card data to the mobility data to, um, you know, all, all, all different areas. And I think being able to dig into that data more and have more access to that data for economists, for statistical agencies, for policymakers is going to really help us to be able to evaluate which policies were um, the most impactful in these times. And hopefully we're gonna learn a lot from that going forward. And I'll stop there. Great, uh, thank you, Tara. So I'll now ask um, our other panelists to turn their microphone and their video back on, please. So we have um, several questions from the audience, but um, I might first ask Tara, David and Anthony um, if they would like to ask each other any questions. No? I, I want to know about the mortality statistics that are going to be released. Maybe, maybe David can't say yet, but um, um, is there, uh, to the extent that he can, are you seeing any excess mortality? So, um, so what we've done, uh, uh, um, there's another question about the fact that we take a long time to publish mortality statistics, and I'm happy to go there. We've, we've uh, started producing a preliminary um, mortality statistics, and we're going to re release them monthly. Uh, and they're based, <coughs> uh, some proportion of, uh, I, this is something I didn't know anything about and have now learned a bit about, some, some relatively small proportion of deaths need to go to the coroner, and that takes a long time. So what we're pub publishing is simply doctor's reports and uh, for those deaths that don't require going to the coroner. I think that covers about 80%, 80 um, I should check that number, so don't quote me. Um, but the answer is we, we saw the, so the, the first release was up to the end of March, and we saw something interesting in the final week of March, suggesting that there might be a pickup in pneumonia deaths that are not related to COVID, that were not, uh, not, uh, that were not, um, not explained by COVID. In other words, the, do the, the COVID was not um, implicated on the death certificate. And so, the, so we saw a pickup in the final, in the last week, but that's uh, of March. And the question is, does that continue into April? And we'll know that uh, when we publish the April numbers, which is fairly soon. So that's a teaser, Anthony. I was gonna ask how much. How much does it go up? Yeah. Uh, um, it's above, the, uh, it, 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 not a huge amount, but the answer is it's above any of the records for the past five years for that week. I might I'll pass to uh, Rob Heinemann now who has a question. I think it may be related to what we've just been yeah. talking Yeah, this, this is related to the same question and is really directed to David. Um, one of the things the pandemic has revealed is just how bad Australia's mortality statistics are, at least in the timeliness of their production. The ABS official mortality statistics were last updated in 2018, and I looked this morning and they're still at 2018. In the middle of a pandemic, surely we need something a little more timely than that. 
and I'm well aware that you've got the provisional mortality statistics now, but they've still got a four month delay. And other countries seem to be producing weekly data with a two week delay. So I'm wondering what's wrong with Australia that we can't produce more timely statistics in such an important um, environment. Uh, so I'm not sure how much is wrong with Australia. I think it might be a slight generalization, but, uh, but uh, let, let's, let's just say, uh, uh, that, that um, it, I think it has to do with uh, the different, um, the different uh, processes by which uh, we get access to data. So we get access to data through the registrars, the state and territory registrars of birth, deaths and marriages. Um, and, and I must say, I'm no expert about this stuff. Uh, it's not quite four months, it's a bit less than that. It's, I think it's because we're about to produce the um, April ones in July, but you're right, it's, it's several months. Um, we get, uh, I think it's 90% of the, of the uh, doctor certified deaths within two months of the end of the month. So we're publishing them after that two month period and then a short period for analysis. So um, uh, the, the answer to your question is simply that the, the, the way that the registrars operate uh, generates a delay and then the way that the, um, the coroner, um, the, the way coroner uh, uh, reporting through coroners generates a further delay. Uh, I guess um, we've made it a lot more um, up to date with, as you say, without the annual data is several, you know, it takes a long time to be published. Um, I guess if there was, if there was huge demand for, for more up-to-date data, um, that then then we'd be um, we'd be trying to make it even more um, or, uh, uh, um, timely. Uh, there's been a lot of demand for more timely data right across the board, and we've responded, as I said in my comments, uh, a, a lot on labour market information and then on um, geographic information about um, concentrations of 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 various things. Uh, and we've, so we have quite actively moved people off things that we thought were of lower relative, pro, uh, lower relative priority in this set of circumstances. Uh, and so ultimately the answer to your question is kind of lack of resources. Um, but I guess if the death rate in Australia went up a long way, uh, as we, as most people would be aware, the total number of deaths in Australia that have been identified from COVID is like 108 or something. Um, so it, we, our experience is extremely different from those from the experience of most other advanced countries where this is a this is a, a first order issue. Uh, but it, it, it's a case of um, making judgments about what uh, are the most important things. And certainly, the judgment that I've made is that that is not uh, that, that that given the other things that we are putting resources onto, um, my judgment's been that they've been more important uh, with limited resources. Thank you. So I'll now pass over to Jenny Gordon for her, her question. Uh, th thanks very much. I must say this is, uh, this is a great, really great seminar, really enjoying it. And to hear that things are finally coming to fruition, like the access to data from single touch payroll, and having pushed for that for the last five, six, I don't know how long, David, we've been pushing for those before. Um, but I'm, I'm now Chief Economist at DFAT, and one of the things we're really struggling with is to try and really understand the supply chain disruptions because you get a lot of, we talk to business a lot, we get a lot of anecdotal information, but it gets really hard to try and work out, you know, whether that's, a, you know, whether it's just an anecdote and a one off and how long it lasts for and how much business is being affected through that. And so I just wondered um, to ask all the panelists whether the sort of data sets that they've been looking at can provide some insight that would give us more information. And it's pretty critical for policymakers because um, a lot of governments are sort of saying, oh, supply chain disruptions mean we need to kind of onshore everything uh, to, to prevent this. So um, getting, getting a good answer to this about what really is disrupted and how critical it is would be really, really useful. Over. Who would like to take on that? <laughs> Um, I can I can uh, just give a quick answer, um, and maybe maybe Jenny and I should talk um, um, uh, offline. Um, but I think the Treasury's been looking into some of this and been using data from the, from our data lab to look at uh, supply chain um, issues. 
uh, I don't know how uh, informative that data is, but certainly it'll be it'll be uh, it'll be looking at that sort of thing to the extent that we've got access through Blade, the the integrated data asset. Um, there may be uh, there may be um, answers you can get out of that stuff, but let's have a com let's uh, let's exchange emails uh, after this, and we'll see where we can where what what we can do for you. Did anyone else want to touch on that issue, Tara Anthony? Uh, we haven't touched anything relevant. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, so, it, what we're hearing from employers is not about supply chains. It, it's really much more about the demand side. It, when it, there's there's two things that are preventing them from um, you know, creating new job opportunities at the moment. One is where their their business has been shut down. Uh, but off, oftentimes the, the bigger concern is from um, not having customers for their products, even if they are um, you know, able to open. Uh, so that's, that's what we're seeing in you know, the US in particular. Um, but uh, it, the company is, it, we're, we're not hearing very often that they're saying like, oh, there's demand for our product, but it's just that we, we don't have the supply chain and that's why we're not hiring more. And it, in, instead companies that where there is demand for their product, they are just hiring more and it doesn't seem like it, they're, they're hiring to get around the supply chain. They're hiring, they're, they're figuring that part out. I think that's easier for them to figure out than the demand side at this stage. So we had a question from Jenny Corbett in the question and answer um, page. And her question is for Anthony. She wants to know what the difference between Kaggle's algorithm for literature searching and existing science metric tools that do similar things. Yeah, um, um, maybe just one clarification. So what Kaggle does is we put out a challenge and people try all sorts of different things to um, respond to the challenge. Um, um, some of the more success, so, um, I would say that there are a combination of techniques uh, that are being used. Um, um, the question answering um, um, uh, you know, little demo where somebody types in a question um, and uh, it, it attempts to answer the question is using a, um, this has been this big, in 2012, there was a really large um, break, step forward in AI and machine learning uh, known as deep neural networks. Um, and uh, in the early days of deep neural networks, really most of the success was with computer vision. With a, there was a, a branch of deep learning called convolutional neural networks and they were very good for computer vision. Um, in 2018, there was a massive breakthrough uh, focused on natural language processing um, and the algorithm uh, that was developed is called um, BERT, which stands for bi-directional encoder something, something. Um, uh, I, I've forgotten the details, um, but um, it's, um, it's really capable of remarkable things um, such as um, uh, like actually, you know, uh, attempting question answering, um, which is something that I think pre 2018 is, is not something you would ever try using natural language processing. Um, so if you compare it with PubMed or uh, Google Scholar, um, what those search engines are trying to do is return result, return, you know, you put in a query and they're trying to return the, the, the best paper to address that query. Um, what the question answering tool is try, trying to do um, is you type in a question and it is trying to directly answer the question. Um, I, I'm not sure if, um, if, if Google Scholar and PubMed were the, the kind of um, sign I don't know what that word is, scientometric tools um, that Jenny was referring to, uh, but hopefully I have answered the question. And, and by the way, I think the question answering is, there's a long way to go on that technology. I don't think it is outstanding. I think it's, it's interesting, um, it can be useful. I think actually though, to be honest, in a lot of cases it is, um, it's useful to use uh, alongside a Google Scholar as opposed to in place of a Google Scholar. Thank you. I'll now pass over to Stuart for his questions. Hi, and, uh, and thanks for very stimulating presentations from everyone. Um, I had two questions. The first to, to David around what the ABS or other statistical agencies can do to correct some of the biases in testing approaches, um, deploying geographically, demographically representative samples, because um, Australia is a good example of one of the more uh, bias criteria in terms of lowest detection rates for asymptomatic cases. So can the ABS 
join the front line in terms of testing. My second question was to, to Anthony to say, well, can Kaggle be used to take the next step or a challenge to take the next step, taking some of that really interesting information, uh, condensing the several thousand papers a week into you know, short, sharp information for policymakers to say, well, you know, what, what's happening internationally on schools? Should schools be open? How do they need protective equipment? Should people be wearing masks? Things like that, a, a, a quick snapshot of say a one pager that a time poor policymaker would read. Stuart, um, maybe I'll go first. So, um the we're um, we've had a think about what how what you would do if you were going to try and do uh, population testing for uh, COVID nineteen uh, based on you know things that other people have done, and the and um, the from a statistical point of view it's um, from a, let me the statement I'm going to make clearly is not true from a health point of view but it is true from a statistical point of view uh, and that statement is that when you have very low share levels of infection in the community um, it's uh, it, it's it becomes harder to um, to come to identify the uh, identify the share of people who have who are who have been infected um, and so you need techniques that oversample hotspots and things like that. So we have, we've thought about that and um, we're ready to go if, if, um, if we're called upon. Uh, ultimately, it'll be a decision that is made by the panel that is kind of, um, I've forgotten it's got some long acronym, but it's basically the health, the, the chief medical officers from around, from around the country uh, who, who make the call about what of what's what of this sort of stuff uh you know what what the protocols are going to be in terms of testing um and um but the but if we were going to do this um obviously we would partner with um with people who who, who, who you, you need people who are actually going to go and do the testing so we're in a position to design a uh, to, to, to help with the design of a population testing regime that would do the best possible job of assessing the proportion of people who have been infected, uh, whether they're asymptomatic, whether they were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic or not. Um, uh, but um, it does require, it, it, it's a substantial um, investment of resources because you've got to test a lot of people. So as I say, we're, we, uh, we've thought about how to design such a thing and if, some, and if, um, if uh, the committee that decides these things decides it's interested in doing it, we're in a position to step in and help. Uh, hi, hi, Stuart. Stuart and I were graduates of the Australian Treasury together, so nice to see you. Um, um, just on our um, on the question you asked for me, you know, should we can we be uh, providing distilled uh, information to policymakers? We have intentionally um, steered clear of that. Um, what we are doing is we're printing uh, or we're presenting. Uh, we're presenting tools and article summary tables, um, and then we we really want um, much more qualified people than us to be um, um, uh, uh, drawing insights. Um, the, the gold standard um, in medical research is something called a um, a meta a systematic review or a meta study, and some portion of that is like just you know, compiling everything that has been written on a certain subject up until now, um, and then waiting, you know, how strong each paper is or how strong each piece of evidence is. Um, and so we're trying to do the heavy lifting on the first part of that, which is just literally automa automatically pulling every single paper that has been written on, you know, whatever the subject is, um, you know, what the conclusion was. Uh, and then we also try and, at least for the article, you know, I showed you the two outputs, for the article summary table output, um, we're also trying to um, give some markers of the quality of evidence, like was it a randomized control trial? Was it a co case cohort study? Was it a prospective, um, a, a retrospective case cohort, a prospective case cohort? How large was the sample? Uh, all those sorts of things. Um, 
um, so that um, the goal is to uh, allow researchers to write systematic reviews more quickly um, so that questions, open questions can be settled more quickly. Um, I think it would be pretty irresponsible for us. You know, we're not domain experts, we're not. Um, it would be somewhat irresponsible for us to be coming in and saying, you know, here are the conclusions. So we're trying to, to build a tool um, that allows systematic reviewers to draw faster conclusions, which is then the thing that in, informs policy. Stuart, did you have, you had a couple of questions on the quick Q&A. Have you asked all your questions? I've asked them both and, and thank you very much for the answers. Great, thank you. Um, David, Stefan has a question. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, had a quick question for David. Um, I was wondering if he'd seen anything so far in whether COVID has started impacting the quality of any of the data you've been collecting. I know there's been a bit of discussion overseas about how COVID has been affecting some of the inflation statistics, um, you know, large changes in consumer bundles and whether you can actually collect price data on things that might not be, might not be available anymore. And uh, while I have you uh, a quick request, any chance you're going to start moving the ABS to monthly CPI. Thank you. It's nice to see all these people from Treasury from a few years ago popping up from various places, um, and includes Anthony, of course. Um, um, uh, once a Treasury official, you, you, you never fully leave it behind. Um, so uh, the answer is, the answer to your question is um, the, that that. Uh, there's a been a uh, there've been a few things that we have had to try and uh, um, uh, make adjustments for. One of them is the one you specifically um, mentioned, which is, and it's kind of a, it's an interesting technical problem in in the sense that there are a whole lot of uh, consumer bundles which um, aren't being consumed. So if part of your consumer bundle is um, the cost of restaurant meals. Um, to what extent is, it, and then you move to a world where restaurants are only allowed to provide takeaway, to what extent is takeaway a close substitute for what you get when you're actually in the restaurant? Well, we can have discussions about that, but from a statistical point of view, you don't have any data on the cost of restaurant meals when no one's allowed to go into a restaurant. And there's, and there's, there's a re there's a reasonable share of the bundle. I, I wouldn't know, I don't know in my head what, what the size is, but think about international travel or, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that are, that are in the CPI that are simply not happening. So we have techniques um, and we uh, just, we talk to methodologists. So the, 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 the uh, one of the people we talk to is Kevin Fox uh, in the University of New South Wales, who, who um, takes a serious interest in index number uh, uh, theory. So we kind of do the best you, you can, but if you ask me the question, does it have an impact? If you, if you have no way of measuring uh, some part of the basket, it has to have an impact. I mean, what, I, mean uh, I don't know how serious it is and we do the best you possibly can, but if the thing doesn't exist anymore, then that matters. Uh, and then the other one is, um, uh, that we have to make adjustments for declining response rates. And as I said, um, uh, in, in, in normal times, so the, the labor force survey, um, we go to about 25,000 households. And for plenty of those people, um, it, it's, it's, they're in our panel for eight months. And uh, often after a month or two, they kind of, they, they've, they've been socialized into doing this. So you don't have to go back to them. But in the first month, getting them kind of into the system, often face-to-face -face is, um, uh, is, um, uh, is the way that you get them into the system by actually turning up on their doorstep and knocking on the door. Well, well we don't do that anymore. Um, so what we have done is use a bunch of behavioral, so, so, we've done some behavioral science experiments to try and raise our um, participation rate. Um, and we've had quite a lot of success. The nature of the envelopes you send people, what you put on the front, we've done a lot of testing of, um, uh, and, and you, have, you can make quite big differences to, uh, to uh, what you, you know, the nature of the letter you send to people can raise response rates by, by quite a bit. But um, again, 
uh, our response rates are down and the way we have, not, not by a massive amount, but by, by a bit. And the way we've responded to that is to increase the, um, the number of, in our incoming rotation groups, we've increased the number of households that we go to, but there's a non-response bias and you have to try and adjust for that. And the way you do that is by looking at the characteristics of the people who don't respond and then overweighting people with those characteristics who have responded in the sample. So those are the sort of things you do, but um, does, it, does, it have a, um, uh, does it have some impact on uh, the quality of the statistics? The answer has to be that it does, and we try and make that as small as possible. And the monthly CPI, any chance? So um, the answer is the monthly CPI's got cheaper. Uh, it, it, to, to introduce a monthly CPI, if you did it 15 years ago, would have cost you a lot more than it would cost you now. And one of the reasons for that is that we now, um, we now get information from the big four supermarkets for, so we have every transaction that goes through the big, uh, de-identified, um, every transaction that goes through the big four supermarkets. So a significant share of the CPI is now collected um, simply by the by getting a data feed from the big four supermarkets, and we do web scraping. So, moving to a uh, a monthly CPI is millions of dollars cheaper than it would have been if you'd done it 15 years ago. Having said that, um, having said that, when we ask policymakers, uh, you know, give them a list of things that they uh, would like us to do, uh, economic policymakers, whether in Treasury or the Reserve Bank. Um, things like broadening the uh, reach of our CapEx survey is higher up on the list than its monthly CPI. So um, the, uh, what we would do without a budget constraint is different from what we do in reality uh, and what we do with one, um, which is probably true of most organisations. Um, but the point is that there are other things that are higher up on people's um, wish list. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you, David, for asking uh, your question. So David's um, zoomed in from Argentina. So um, now we might zoom over to Malaysia. And um, Anela Munro has a question on the Q&A. Um, I think for Anthony, it's about the Kaggle data on temperature and humidity. So can you say anything about the latest results based on that data? And how important is the southern winter now and prospects for the northern autumn? Um. Uh, before I went out on parental leave, I was trying to pay very close attention to uh, what people were doing uh, based on Kaggle data sets or, or our literature, like based on our projects. Um, unfortunately, I've been out for uh, maybe a couple of months now, uh, so I've lost touch. So I, I don't know the answer, unfortunately. Okay, um, I think we've come to the uh, the end of our webinar. We've uh, been through all of the questions. I knew this was going to be a fantastic webinar. So thank you so much, Tara and David and Anthony for um, sharing your insights um, with us. Um, before we come to the end, I'd just um, like to let you know that our next webinar will be held next week on international econo economic cooperation post COVID-19. And this event will be hosted by David Vines from Oxford University, who runs the Karma Globalization and Trade Program here. And it will feature Cameron Hepburn, Christopher Adam, and Beata Jarovic from Oxford. And Beata is also the Chief Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as well as um, Warwick McKibben. So um, we come to the time where we we're about to thank our speakers. So. I know that we can't hear you, but um, please at home, give our, our speakers a round of applause because we all know that the world needs good karma um, and that is one way of doing so. So thank you so much um, everybody for your wonderful presentations and great questions. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks Renee. Thanks Joaquin. Thanks everyone.